This uh, sermon was started two months ago when I finished my other sermon on going home. And if any, any of you remember how disappointed I was when I came back from Vietnam, this was not my home that I used to recognize. But I am looking forward to another home, a home in heaven with my Savior where peace, peace and security does reign. And as I thought about it, I was thinking about Terrell telling a parable because Jesus spoke in parables. I said, well, that would be a good thing, speaking parables. Well, I thought, well, I, I've, got a, I've got a story I can tell you, and I am going to tell you that story. And it involves, well, at least it did, it involves the King's Heralds. Imagine that, King's Heralds. Two months ago, I was thinking about the King's Heralds. Two months. What happened here two weeks ago? We get a call that the King's Heralds want to come here, and they're going to come here. You see, what happens, part of my story, is I ended up with my first nursing home with Adventist Health Systems. And it was in Lagoti, Indiana. Lagoti, Indiana is way down in southern Indiana. And it's uh, basically a Catholic community, by predominantly Catholic. And it was the first home, Adventist Health System had purchased this home. And I had about a week to get down there. And of course, the rumors got, there's no Adventists in that town that we know of. It was a dark county, no Adventists. And I'm going, my, you can imagine the rumors that were spread. And so I'm the first administrator. And I have to make sure that I represent my church adequately. And I got to meet the Catholic priest. He would come all the time, every, every, probably about every day, other, every other day to meet his parishioners and spend time with him. And I got to know him. Well, then about two months in, I get a call from corporate office. And he said, the King's Heralds are going to be coming through. Would you have a place for them to stay? We'll pay for them. I go, wow, where am I going to, there's nothing, in, I don't have anything in my facility. So I asked the Catholic priest, I said, do you have a place for the King's Heralds? And he goes, yeah, they can, they can sing in our new rectory. We've been planning this rectory, we've been building it for over a year. It's brand new. Nobody's been in, nobody's even had a wedding or anything in there. Yes, they can be the first ones. And so they were welcomed into this Catholic rectory, which the first people to sing in it. And after they sang, oh, and he says, and I'll announce it at Mass on Sunday. And so we had a packed house. And the next day, or it was the day after, I don't remember exactly, he says, man, those guys were good. They can come back any time in my church if they want to. So I'm inviting each of you this evening, 6.30, the King's Heralds are going to be here, and I want to make sure that Every one of you will be here to receive the blessings that you will receive by spending time listening to them. So now I can get into my sermon. But please come. You'll enjoy. I asked my daughter, by the way, I asked my daughter about it. I said, do you remember the King's Herald? She was like in third grade. She said, oh, yes. She said, they, they sang. And she says, and you bought a tape. And you bought a tape. And every Sabbath when you went to church, you put that cassette in the car, and we listened to the King's Heralds. I remember that, she said. I don't know if she got fed up with me playing it all the time, but it was, re it was really good. Anyhow, please come. As I said, Jesus spoke in parables. And as I finished last, or two months ago when I finished the sermon, I was thinking of my home, and I said, I want to make sure I can get there. I want to make sure I get there. I want to make sure I go the right way. And that's, that's my sermon, The Way. I got a call from Adventist Health Center. I was an assistant administrator in a Wisconsin facility. And they called me up and very nicely said, do you want, we have a facility we just purchased, do you want to go? Well, you, you are going to go. They're already paying your wages. They're training you. They're doing, yeah. It, it's, but it was a nice way of saying, we have a facility. Get down there as quick as you can. And I did. They said, you'll, you'll get down there. You'll have to find a place to live. And we'll send a moving van We'll get you and your family packed up, and they'll arrive a few days after you do. So I'm, 
I'm on my way, I dig out a map, I find out where Lagoti, Indiana is, way down south, 600 and some miles, around 600 miles from where I am in Wisconsin. So I get down into Lagoti. Again, uh, about 2,500 population, predominantly a Catholic community, a nice new, brand new 64 bed nursing home that's only been about three years old. And I have to, I meet the people, and I'm, I'm trying to find a place to live. And one of the ladies, I don't know if it was a CNA or a nurse, says, well, I have an Auntie Pearl that lives out of town. They just built a new house and finished it this last year. And their old house, they, she's talking about maybe renting out the old house that they had lived in before. But she's about seven miles down in the, out in the hills. I didn't understand what she meant by out in the hills. I did later. They, see, they, speak, they speak a different language in the hills. See, the rest of the town spoke English like I'm, I'm used to, okay? What worries? But they speak a little different dialect. It's not a southern dialect, it's a hill dialect. A southern dialect is kind of a drawl. You all do, you know. The hill di high, high dialect is a, a nasal. It's Ian's, Ian's face up now. That, that, it's English, but it's a different English, okay? So anyhow, uh, back then, we didn't have cell phones for you young people who now have cell phones. We had landlines. And I got her number, and I called her up, and she told me, yes, she would be willing to look at, if I was interested, that she would go and prepare the house. She, would get, she said, nobody's lived there since we've left. I'll make sure it's all ready for you. What time do you want to be? And she says, well, I'll have to give you directions. How are you going to get? She's going to show me, tell me the way to get to the home I'm going to be living in. And there's a parallel between this and the way God tells me to get to his home. She says, first of all, there's only, there's only one way out there. So listen very carefully. She says, how, I'll tell you how to get there. There are no, no Highway 281 or Highway 80. There's no signs in the hills. There's not a sign there. Well, there is signs, but they're a little different. And the roads are uh, whining, to say the least. They're up hills, down hills. They wind back and forth. It's seven miles from town. And she starts giving me directions. She said, well, first you go drive out. Of the, she knows how to get there. She said, drive out to the nursing home. Just, just go north. And I go, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm I am uh, challenged, directionally challenged. I don't know where north and south and east. Could you tell me? She said, okay. And she begins, and here's, here's some of the directions of how to get to my new home on this earth. You'll go out, you'll turn right. She said, you'll turn right. And oh, by the way, I had to write everything down because the, the, this thing is, bugs me. <laughs> I had to write everything down. And my writing is atrocious, to say the least. If, if I read something I wrote a year ago, I probably won't be able to understand what I wrote. So I'm, write, I'm writing it down. It's about a page and a half of directions. And to give you an idea, I won't go through the whole thing, but to give you an idea. So she said, go out and turn right. Out of the nursing home, you turn right. Now you'll go down. She said, I think it's four or five blocks. It's some, I, think it's, I think it's the first stop, that, but there could be a stoplight in between. But it's one of the main, main drags, and if you look down a ways, if you look down a ways, you'll see the, the, some of the stores and stuff, so you'll know you'll be on the right street. So when you stop at that stop sign, then go right. And you'll go right until you run into the fairgrounds, which is probably maybe 10 blocks. I asked her, I said, what do the fairgrounds look like? She said, well, maybe that'd be a bad... Uh, uh, the John Deere dealership is there on the right-hand side. He said, that's where you turned. I said, okay, the John, do I turn before or after the John Deere dealership? She said, oh, after the dealership, right after. There's a road that goes out of town, and you'll, you'll take, turn that road, and that goes to about, about a quarter mile, and it'll, start, it'll, v, it'll V out. One, one road will go to the right, and the other one will go to the left. Now, the one going to the left is a, looks like it might be a little, little less traveled. The one going to right is more track. But if you don't go right, she says, don't go right, go left. Because the right road, will, you'll end up back where you started out at. You'll end up back in town. So go left. I said, okay, I'll go left. Now, 
By the way, I had to stop several times along the way to read my notes to make sure I was going the right way. And uh, as I'm driving, oh, the next thing she says, now you go down that road. Now the road will eventually turn back right, and you'll start going right. And then off to your distance on the right-hand side, you'll see a, harvester, a blue harvester silo. OK, a blue harvester silo. Do anybody know what blue harvester silos look like? Some of you do. They're a blue harvester silo. And I go, OK. She said, well, OK, now that's, that's a, a sign that you're getting close to where you're supposed to turn. OK, that's a sign. But at least it's, it's, it's a sign. It's, I can see it. And then she said, when you get there, OK, when you're about even with that, you'll, you'll have just crossed a, a, a hill. And over to your left-hand side, there'll be a bunch of Holstein cows in the field. I go, Holstein, Holstein cows move, but they're going to be in this pasture. Somehow she knew the country well enough. I didn't know it. Some of these cows in this pasture. And she said, go to the end of that pasture. And then you, there's a little road that turns off the left. Follow that road. Turn left there. And so I, I turn left there and I follow. And she says, now, you follow that road, there'll be some twists and turns. And when she said, and there was some up and down. When she said, she meant twists and turns and ups and downs and rounds about. And she and I think it's about two miles. OK. I, I, I know if I go straight what two miles is, but twists and turns and ups and downs kind of change. She says, well, you'll get to about two miles out. I think it's two miles, she said. I think it's about two miles, she said. You'll come on the top of the hill, and it's be quite steep hill, and you'll go down, and at the bottom of the hill, there's a bridge. There'll bridge you cross. You'll cross this bridge. And just after you cross the bridge, after you cross, there's a road to the right. You've got to take that road. OK, so road. That's how the whole direction went, on and on and on, until I got to the place. It, it, I couldn't explain to you how to get there, nor could I today. I probably couldn't even get there today. It was up and down and all the different roads. But I finally arrived at the place, and she's the most wonderful lady you'll ever want to meet. And she showed me what was going to be my home. I made it. But the important parts of this story is I was going home. The important start, part of my life is I'm going to see my Heavenly Father. I'm going home. There's only one way, she said. All, all she, she said, and if you get lost, and if you get lost, you turn around. She said, you can always give me a call. Stop at some house along the way and give me a call, and I'll, I'll correct you. But most people know where we live down here in the hills, so they can direct you. So if they can't, call me, and I'll show you. OK. There's one way. The path, the path had lots of twists and turns. Just like my Christian walk has lots of twists and turns, your Christian walk has lots of twists and turns. If I didn't take the right path, I could stop and ask someone. If I'm going wrong, I can ask a church member. I said, what am I supposed to be doing? And they, they will correct me. Or, or I can get on my cell phone, or, no, the landline, but Christ was more, more advanced than we were. I can pray to him, and he can give me directions if I get lost. So that was, that was all good. OK. These roads were, what, narrow? They were tiny. They were small. They were roads you, most people wouldn't even think of going down. And I went down them. And I thought, how, like God, he explains roads. He said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, but narrow is the road that leads to life. Now, for our, for our scripture, I'm going to go to John 14. And I want to read a little bit in John 14. Ah, uh, oh, 14. Well, there, I'll read before, I'll read before uh, one. Oh, let not your heart be troubled. What had happened here was Jesus was leaving. He was going away, and he's trying to tell the disciples what, it, what, what they're going to be doing, that he's going to wait to prepare them. In fact, that's what this says. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. There's my home, one of those mansions, that place I'm going to be living. And I'm yippee, I've got a place. I go to prepare a place for you. Just like she went and said, I've I got to go over to the house and make sure it's ready for you. He is going to make sure it's ready for me. 
it's going to fit me. Me. This, this humble person that doesn't even probably deserve to be there had it been not for Christ. And he says, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am you may be also. And where I go you know and the way you know. But Thomas said to him, this was me, Lord, how do we know where you're going? And how can we know the way? And that's the sermon. How do we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. He is the way. My father, when he was dying two months before he died, I was riding in the car with him. And he didn't say much. He had several TIAs, mini strokes, okay, so he, he didn't talk much. And we're driving down the road on a winter day, and all of a sudden he looks to me and says, there's no name under heaven whereby you can be saved but one, Jesus Christ the righteous. And that was all he said to me. That was the last thing my father said to me. There is no way except through Jesus Christ. He is the way. So I got so interested in the word, I like to go to my strong concordance and I had to look it up. So I looked up the word way. What the way, what way means. And it's interesting, we have way in Greek and we have it in Hebrew. Now I've looked up many words that were translated either from Greek or Hebrew and their definitions are slightly varied, very varied, should I say. But the way, I could line both the Greek and Hebrew up and they were almost identical in their description. Almost identical. The way, when they talk about way, it means, literally means the path or the road. The path or the road. Remember that, the path or the road, literally. So when Jesus said, I am the way, I am the path you must follow. I am your example. I am the path. I am the way. That's how you get there, following this road, following the path that I have taken. Okay. Figuratively or metaphorically or symbolically, what it means is a conduct of action. It's a, it's a habit you get into. It's a way of life. So do we live the life that Christ... So I said, if I'm going the right way, I'm living the life that Christ lived. That's right. I'm on the path that he went on. I'm on the road that he took. Now the first time... Boy, I'm having a, I'm having a hard time with this thing today. Kept keep catching under my coat. Anyhow, the, the first time in the Bible the word way is used... Pay attention. Genesis 3, 24. This is after man had sinned. God kicked him out of the garden, and he did something. And he drove the man out, and he placed a cherubim at the east of the Garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every which way to guard the way to the tree of life, to guard the this road, this path to the tree of life. You can, we can no longer get to the tree of life because there's a flaming sword that will prevent us, that will kill us if we try to get into the garden. We, we have death for sure. There's no other way. We have sinned, for all have sinned and come short of the glory. So none of us have a right to go down that path that way. Because of sin, we cannot make it to the tree of life. But Christ provides us a way. He died for me. He died for you. He died. He paid the price for my sin so that I don't have to suffer the death. I can pass by these swords, this flaming sword and stuff. Many people can't. They're going to be destroyed. But somehow, he is able to protect me by his blood. And the other thing is, other way, thing in a way is I must be born again. I, I can't make it as, a, as the old man. There's no way I can make it as the old man. I must have a new life. I must have a new character. That's part of the being in the way, having the right character. 
What does the Bible say about it? John said, John says, most assuredly I tell you that unless one is born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You're not going to make it to your home, your heavenly home, unless you are born again, you, unless you're a new creature. Through Christ, he is the way, he is the road. It was interesting after the uh, Jesus rode from the dead, uh, Peter was out talking to the group, and they, and they said something about, well, what must we do? What must we do? How can we, get, how can we get to heaven? What must we do? And Peter said these words, repent and let every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You will receive the gift of... He is our guide. He guides us in a way. We repent of our sin, we're born again, and the Holy Spirit, God, out of love, gives us the Holy Spirit to help guide us along the path that we're supposed to go. He shows us the way. He lights, He's the truth. He shows us the right way on the path that he's given us. Wherever, wherever, from wherever we're coming from, he shows us the way. First John says, if we walk in the light or the truth as he is in the light and we have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all sin. In other words, we won't have any sin. We're able to walk past the fiery swords. We're able to walk, walk through this dangerous area and, and arrive on the other side where most die. His light, his, his commandments, the lamp unto my feet. We must abide, abide by his commandments. We must keep his word. What, what does it mean, an example of what happens when we, when we find Christ? What happens in your life when we find it? We're walking a certain way, and it's a way of, way of death. We're walking. And I thought of a good example in the Bible is Paul. Paul, a uh, good example is me. I was walking way of death. I had my own agenda, what I was going to do, what I was going to, going to accomplish. I was going to do this. I was going to do this. I was going to, I, 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 I. I had I, I, I problems. And that's the same thing Paul had, or Saul, I should say. He, at his own admission, he said, I was a Pharisee's Pharisee. I was a Pharisee. I was number one among the Pharisees. I'm going to walk this path of a Pharisee. I'm going to do what the Pharisees require. I'm going to advance. I'm going to be the number one Pharisee in this country, the number one. That's me. I'll do whatever's required to accomplish what I need to accomplish. And he stood by, although he didn't, he didn't himself stone, stone Stephen. He's held the coats. And if, and if you don't object to it and you stand by, you're just as guilty as the one that threw the stones. So he, he's now, he, he's, embodied, he, he's emboldened to do more things. He wants to go out and, and, and kill more or bring more Christians into, into the chief priests and see that they're punished. So he's going to Damascus. And on the road, he runs into someone. And that someone is Christ. And he sees a light and he's blinded. And he's blinded. He can't see. So this proud man now is blinded. He can't see. He can't. He's gone on the path he wants to go, but now he's blinded. He can't see the path anymore. Blind. Have any of you ever been blind for a while? I had about three days of blindness. It's probably one of the most humbling experiences you ever want to rely on somebody else to take you every place you need to go. And, and, and that was Paul. He had to be led by the hand every place he wanted to go. He was humbled. And God has a way of humbleness, humbling us. If we get to look at Christ, we become nothing but humbled. We can be nothing but humbled. Because he is so far superior to us. So he was humbled. And the way he walked changed. He came out of that. He accepted he accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. And guess what? What was his path then? Where did his path go? What was the way he went? He had an adventure that none of us could ever imagine. 
Can you imagine? He goes here, he goes all over the then known world doing God's will, telling people about the Savior. Tell, that's, that, being a Christian is an adventure. Walking in his way is an adventure. It's a thrilling and it's an exciting thing. I was walking one way before I found Christ, and I walked totally another way afterwards. Oh, I got lost sometimes, but I always found the way back. This word was written by many people over many years with the guidance of the Holy Spirit. It wasn't, I can read this word just like I tried to read my writings, my scribblings, and sometimes it's, it's a little hard to understand, at least initially. It's becoming easier as years go by. The writings become clearer and clearer. I can find a way. The other thing is we can't make it on our own. We cannot make it on our own. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but it leads to destruction. It leads to death. How can I make sure I am on the right path? Well, part of it's being baptized, accepting Jesus, repenting of your sins, accepting him. There are signs along the way. It's not a harvester silo, but there are signs. The Lord knows the steps we'll take. He guides our steps. If we accept him, he's guiding our steps. He lights our path. I ended up reading one of, the, one of the best ways to know that we're Christians, that we're going the right way, is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12. He talks about the gifts God's given us, and he gives us all gifts. And by the way, we had wonderful gifts. I, I was divert a little from my sermon. Last night was a wonderful gift, and thanks, ladies, for all you did to set up that meal. That was wonderful. There was a lot that went into it, and I really appreciate it, and thank you from the bottom of my heart. What a blessing. So we all have gifts, but he says, I will show you, I will show you, there will be a sign, I'll show you a more excellent way. And then he says, what's that way? How do we know we're going the right way? by this indispensable love that he has given us, one for another. He said, you'll know, my, you'll know my disciples by the love that they have for one another. Do you, love, do you love your fellow Christians? Do you love all people? It's hard, but do you? If you do, you're on the way. You're on the right path. You're, you're going the way you should do. You can look forward to that heavenly home. You're doing that love not because it'll earn you the right to heaven. You do that because that's what Jesus does and he is our examples. He showed us the way, the character we should have. And if we do it out of genuine love, we are on the right way. Love is a sign that we are doing what's right. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is in the book of book of love called 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another for love is of God and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. But John also wrote in John 13, by this you will know that they are my followers or my disciples by the love that they have for one another. Do you love your brothers and sisters? in Christ. We know that is a sign that we are going the right way. Love is so important and that Jesus himself says, I give you a new commandment. What's that new commandment? That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That is the commandment. It was so important to him that he, we, we knew that sign. That's the sign we need. 
It's interesting that the Lord talks about the walk, even in the Old Testament. I was surprised as I was looking up verses. I come across this in Jeremiah. Jeremiah says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I have set before you a way of life, the way of life, and the way of death. Choose which path you want to go on. That was why I added that. Choose which path. You can go either life or you can go death. You can go the way you want to go, or you can go the way the, the right way. I also thought about the rich young ruler as I was doing this, writing this sermon. Remember, he had everything. He said, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be coming to your camp? What must I do? And what did he say? Did Jesus say to him? He had everything. Give it all up. Follow me. Take my way. You can take my way, the backward path, or the highway, the smooth road, but you won't get there. You'll end up back where you started from if you take the wrong V in the road. And one of the verses that we shared this in our Sabbath school this morning was in Psalms 143, verse 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Remember, love is a sign. For I have put my trust in you. I have faith in you. That is the way. The way of love and faith. Show me the way I should go for to you I entrust my life. Do we entrust our lives to Jesus? Do we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and realize everything will be added to us, that he will guide us through the whole, whole process? And I, as I read one of the final ones, verses is Exodus 23:20. It says, Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place that I have prepared. Wow. Same thing in the New Testament. He is the way. He wants us to the place he's prepared for us. And he goes, as Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. That's my home. He's prepared it. It's ready for me. It's ready for you. You just need to follow the directions to dig in the book, let the Holy Spirit guide you through all of this, and you will be there. And I hope to see you there. I hope to be there. He's a very forgiving and a very loving God who will guide us all the way. And if we get lost, guess what? He's got a, a thing of communication which is far above our cell phones. We just have to get down on our knees and start talking to him direct. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we trust you to open up the paths, to open up the roads we need to go, to make us over in your image so that we can spend an eternity with you, surrounded by your love. Guide and direct us by your spirit now in the coming week that we may work, our path may lead to you and we will be surrounded by your love. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.